Hello. I understand you guys want to do some Viking. Sounds good to me. Tell you what, before we go Viking though, I want to just give you a little background as to why and what we're doing here. All right. Now, here we go. Over here, Saskatoon. Over here, that's where all the Viking stuff was going on. So we're down in here in Britain and we're in Denmark, Finland, Norway, Sweden, that area right there. That's where it's all happening. All right. Now, way back when, the Norse people living along the, the Denmark coast, Scandinavian coast, they were farmers. They raised chickens and cattle and sheep and goats. They also farmed the land, but because the land was so rocky, the soil is quite thin, it's difficult to get a really good crop off the ground. But they lived right beside the ocean. So they were also seafaring people. So they did a lot of fishing, a lot of fishing, a lot of eating fish. Now, as they were fishing, the way they built boats got better and better. You build one boat, you learn from mistakes, you build a better boat. All right. So as they were fishing and farming and building better boats, they got up to a point where they could actually travel around. And they met up with people and they traded for things. They got better ideas, better equipment. And before long, they had the technology to build what we call the long ship. So with the long ship, this fellow right here, they were able to go really far and travel for many, many days and collect a lot of different materials, trade for materials. And what they would do, they would go all through Europe. This picture here, you can see all the places they were going to get resources such as iron and whatnot and better equipment, uh, trade for salt. Salt was very important because it helped them preserve their food for the winter. Yes, yes, yes. And then eventually they said, you know what? I think we'd like to go over there to England, this fellow here. And I, then in that monastery there, they got some good stuff. I think I'd like it. So they got in their longboat, got their swords and their shields and off to England they went and they decided to take what they wanted and thus they were Viking. All right. So if we want to go Viking, we too have to get ourselves a long ship. So tell you what, why don't I meet you over there and we'll find out what it takes to get a long ship built. So we need ourselves a long ship. Well, first off, how big is a long ship? I'll tell you what. Now back then they didn't have these Hot Wheels <laughs> for measurements, but we do. So imagine when you're on the street and you're wondering to yourself, how big is a long ship? A long ship is actually one, two, so two long, two wide, and two more in length. So you have one length, one length, one length, one length. One, two, three, four, five. So five car lengths is how long it is. That's 23 meters. Width-wise, it is one car length wide. That's five meters. Now, if you were to be sailing along in a long ship and you wanted to go into the, the bottom of it, how deep is a long ship? How deep is it? If you were to put a car on its edge like that, the deep, how, the, sorry, the depth of the long ship is a meter and a half, same as a car. All right. Now you're sailing about, you're going into oceans, you're going into lakes and you're going into rivers and things like that. Just how close can you get to the shoreline? Well, the nice thing about a long ship, the way it's designed is that the draft, that's the amount of water you need before the, the ship will actually hit bottom along the shoreline is only one meter. That's three feet. So that means this long ship can sidle up right to the shoreline to unload and load and do all sorts of things. Whereas other ships, they have to be way off out there with an anchor. The long ship, nope, zoop, right into the shoreline, grab their stuff, zoop, right out again. Perfect design for doing Viking and raiding. All right. So that is how long a long ship is. And also, how many people can you put in a long ship? Well, the long ship has all these oars. It has 32 or 16 pairs of oars, 32 oars, 16 pair. So you need 35 at minimum, so they could use the oars, steer, things of that nature. But you can fit, depending on your purpose, if you're going, say, trading or raiding, you can put about 35 to 120. You can carry up to 120 warriors and all their equipment in one of these long ships. So if you're off to do some Vikings, some raiding, you can put all 100 of your friends, 120 of your friends. All right. So we now know 
how big this long ship is, but how many trees do we need to build this long ship? Now, long ships were built out of oak. Oak trees, very sturdy wood. They also used pine trees. Pine trees were used for the mast, the oars, the planking inside the ship and things like that. But the hull, the, 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 the part that keeps everything going and everything afloat was built of oak trees. You would need, apparently, experimental archaeologists built a Viking longship. And they discovered they needed 15 oak trunks measuring five meters long and one meter in diameter. Remember, five meters is the length of a car. So let's just find out what that means. So I'm going to start collecting all the oak trunks that I need to build myself that 23 meter long, five meter wide Viking longship. This is just the oak that's needed for building the hull of the vessel. All right, so we're up to nine cars now. And here's the tenth one. So you need the amount of oak lumber that you need that represents 15 trunks, five meters long and one meter in diameter. You would need upwards of 10, the volume, the volume that 10 cars would take. So when you go into a parking lot and you put 10 cars together, that volume of material is what you would need in oak trees in order to build your longship. That's a lot of trees. We have a longship design. We have wood to build a longship. Now we have to make something to put it all together and hold it together. All right. In Scandinavia and Denmark and all that area, there's a lot of bogs. In those bogs, as the water runs down through the mountains, through the soil and into the peat bogs, a lot of elements and minerals come together. And when they go into the bogs and they peel back the layer of the bog, underneath the peat were all these pea-sized grains of what's called bog iron. So they collect all these pea-sized grains of bog iron, bring it back to the blacksmith. And the blacksmith's job was to smelt down all this material and make it into usable iron to create rivets and washers. It would take upwards of 150 kilograms, 330 pounds, of all these little pea-sized bog, bog iron pellets to make that. So can you imagine how much time you're spending in the bogs just looking for little pea-sized elements of iron? That's crazy. Whew. Okay, so now we've got ourselves our iron, our wood, our design, and we're going to start building that ship. Now, Hmm, just how long is this going to take us to build? Let's see. Well, it won't be built in a weekend, I can tell you that much. You're going to need, in order to build this longship, you are going to need, by experimental archaeologist, a hundred people. You're going to need nine months. The reason for nine months is because you don't construct anything during the three months of winter. So you got nine months to take a hundred people and each of those 100 people spend 11 hours a week working towards this longship. Now, when you add that up, apparently it comes to approximately 40,000 hours of labor to build the longship, plus all the rigging, the ropes, the masting, the planks, and everything like that. Now, the reason that they're only spending 11 hours a week, each of them working towards building this longship, is because you have to remember they're farmers. Primarily responsibility, excuse me, the primary responsibility is that you have to grow enough food, you have to fish for enough food, you have to produce things in uh, uh, salted or smoked or preserved because you have to feed yourself, you have to feed your family, and you have to have enough stored for the winter. So in your community, your first responsibility is to make sure the community survives by having enough food. Second responsibility is to work towards things such as smelting iron for weaponry or agricultural or implements or um, building long ships and things of that nature. So first responsibility to the community, second responsibility to projects like the long ship, 40,000 hours to build, 100 people contributing their labor and talents 
but you got to take care of your cow and got to take care of your sheep. All right. Now, not only does the longship have 16 pairs of oars or 32 oars that help it can go places when there's no wind, but when there is a wind, a marvelous piece of technology for back then was the invention of the sail. Now, how big was a sail on the longship? When you go into a mall and you see the lines painted in the parking lot so par cars know where to park themselves, if you were to look at six of those parking stations for six cars, <coughs> and you are to look at that entire space, that is 36 square meters. That is 36 square meters of space and that is how big the sail was on a Viking ship. So they would have to, some people would be responsible to have the sheep, to shear the sheep, collect the wool, spin the wool, and then fabricate it into a sail. Not only that, once the sail is made, which can take anywhere from three to four years, three to four years to make, not just by one person, but by a group of people, then they take a bunch of fat, bunch of animal fat and they smear this animal fat into that wool and the reason for that is so when the wind blows the wind wouldn't just blow through the wool it would actually the fat stops the wind and it holds the sail together and that will obviously cause the, the sail to collect the wind and move forward but could you imagine what that must have smelt like on a nice hot sunny day all that fat in that sail <laughs> you're sailing along mmm so the Viking ship, the Viking longship, has a sail and it has 16 pairs of oars. How fast is that? With a sail, the Viking longship can go 15 to 20 knots in speed, which is 37 kilometers per hour. Your school zone is 30 kilometers per hour. So a little faster than those vehicles there. Oars, when they're paddling with 32 oars, it's five to six knots, which is rowing at 11 kilometers per hour and to put that into a comparison we walk at 5 kilometers per hour so rowing 11 kilometers per hour sailing 37 kilometers per hour and that's going to get you to where you want to be all right we got ourselves a long ship now we need a destination i suggest we take a nice tour through the nine realms of norse mythology Okay, so here we have ourselves a handy map of the nine realms of Norse mythology. Lots of stuff happening here. But first I want to introduce you to some of the creatures in this realm. Up here we have Odin's ravens. And Odin's ravens are Hujin, which means thought and memory, Munin. So Hujin thought and Munin memory. And these two ravens fly all through the nine realms and they're looking and listening to lots of things and they report back to Odin as to what's going on. Another interesting relationship of three of these animals is that this eagle here, it's a very large eagle, nameless eagle, but between the eyes of this eagle lives a hawk. That hawk's name is Vedfilnir. There's a squirrel. That squirrel's name is Radistock. And the dragon way down here that's Nidhogg all right now this squirrel Radistock loves to create a little bit of a tussle between Vedfilnir the hawk that lives between the eyes of the eagle and Nidhogg the dragon so he'll run the Radistock will run up the, the tree go to Vedfilnir and say do you know what Nidhogg said about you oh he said some awful things about you can you believe that and then Vidfilnir gets all angry and says, well, this is what I think about Nidhogg the dragon. Then Radistock will run down and tell the dragon, guess what the hawk said about you? And of course the dragon gets all upset and says, well, this is what I think about the hawk. And then, then the squirrel runs back up <laughs> and keeps the, the animosity between the dragon and the hawk going. Why? Because I, I guess it's fun for the squirrel. There you go. Another animal in the Nine Realms that is very important is Jormungand the wolf serpent and the wolf serpent surrounds the earth in a continuous circle holding on to his tail and at the time of Ragnarok at world's end this this wolf serpent will release its tail creating earthquakes all through the 
the world, bringing on the end of days, Ragnarok. So we got ravens, eagles and hawks, squirrels, sea serpents, or wolf serpent actually, dragons. Oh, and right here, there's four deer that live at the base of Yardasol, the world tree. And these four deer represent the four winds, the four directions, and the four elements. All right. So here we have a representation of the nine realms of Norse mythology. Front and center, we have the Yardasol tree. And the Yardasol tree supports all these nine realms. And its branches, way up high, where all the gods live. All right. At the base of the Yardasol tree are those four deer that represent the four winds, four directions, four elements of the earth. All right. Also, at the base of the Yardasol tree, there's a well. There are three wells in the Nine Realms. This well is the Well of Fate. And the Well of Fate is guarded by these three Norns. Now, what these three Norns do is that they represent past, present, and future. And when you're born, the three Norns will pick up a stick and they'll basically create notches in it, and that is your fate stick. So your fate is already predetermined. You can't do anything about it, and it's created by these three Norns. But what makes these Norns special is that not only do they create the fate and destiny of humans, but they also create the fate and destiny of all the gods as well. So very powerful. The three Norns and the Well of Fate. Over here in Jotunheim, the land of giants, is another well, and this is the Well of Wisdom. And this is the well where Odin came to, because Odin wanted to acquire all the wisdom he could, and Jotuns are giants, huge creatures, and they live for centuries. So they have lots of knowledge of the past, a lot of wisdom, and Odin wanted that wisdom. So what he did is that he said in trade for his right eye, he gave up his right eye, he put his right eye in that well of wisdom that gave Odin all the wisdom that he has. So that is in Jotunheim. And there's a third well, and it's called the Roiling Kettle, and it is located in Niflheim, and this is where all things go that were once alive when they're dead. So they all go back there for some recycling. All right. At the top of the Artisol tree, in the highest branches, are all the gods live. Now, right here, we have the realm of Vanaheim. Vanaheim is sorcery, magic, fertility gods. And what happens when there's a battle and there's a fallen warriors everywhere, the gods of Vanaheim get the first pick. They bring their pick of warriors here to the Hall of Many Seats. And in the Hall of Many Seats, those warriors get to dine and relax and visit and have a very nice, calm life. Now, next door is Asgard, and Asgard is where Odin lives, gods of all the gods. During a battle, Vanaheim gets first pick, but after that, Odin gets second pick. And Odin's looking very spe for a very specific type of warrior. He's looking for the elite warriors, and he brings those elite warriors to Asgard to live in Valhalla. Now, in Valhalla, these elite warriors wake up each morning and they go into courageous battle. Big deeds of valor and all sorts of things. Then after the battle, all their, he all their wounds will magically heal. And then they eat this boar. And then once the boar is eaten, the boar magically regrows to be eaten again. And they also have a goat in there. It's a magic goat because any the meat or milk or anything you want from a goat, that goat will give you it and never run out. Now Odin does this because he has a special purpose for these elite warriors. At the time of Ragnarok, when the gods have to battle the giants, Odin needs that elite army in order to help defeat those giants. Now next door to Asgard is Elfheim. This is where it's the, light, the home of the Light Elves. And the Light Elves deals in magic and nature and things of that, na that, that sort. And the they're very beautiful creatures, very bright and brilliant in their appearance. 
And the thing about the Elfheim and these, these light elves is they like to come down to Midgard where the humans live and kind of fool around with us. Just kind of mess us up and do a few trickeries and whatnot. But this is Elfheim where the light elves live. So we've climbed off the tree. We went down the Rainbow Bridge because the only way that gods and humans can actually connect with each other is by the Rainbow Bridge or Shimmering Bridge or the Bifrost Bridge. And it connects the home of the gods down to Middle Earth over Yardasol, and now we're in Middle Earth, home of the humans, our three pine cone warriors. That represents Midgard. That's where the humans live. Over here in all these rocks and caves and caverns and labyrinths, that is the that is called Nid Nidavellir, which is the home of the dwarves. And beneath that, that you can't see because it's so far down, is home of Svaltaheim. Now in Nidavellir, Nidavellir, home of the dwarves, their cousins, they live in Svaltaheim. They are the dark elves. So the dwarves are on top and further down are the dark elves. And they create all these magical armaments and swords and spears and rings and jewelry and whatnot that have magical spells attached to them. That's where all that comes from right there. And then next door to the... The Midgard on the other side is Jotunheim, land of the giants, and again, that well of wisdom. And the land of the giants, the giants and the gods, they're always fighting each other and not really getting along, but sometimes they do. Because believe it or not, if you know Loki, Loki is actually a giant. Loki actually comes from Jotunheim, but he actually gets along because there's some blood relationships happening between uh, the gods and some of the Jotuns. Rounding out the tour here of our nine realms of Norse mythology. Come into some areas where, hmm, you kind of want to watch your wallet. <laughs> okay, here we have Muspelheim. Muspelheim is the uh, realm of the fire giants. As you can see, he's having himself a little barbecue here. And uh, the fire giants are also responsible for creating all the stars and whatnot in the sky as they hit sparks and whatnot. So Muspelheim, land of the giants. Here we have hell, and hell is just not a nice place to be. Um, all the people that weren't deserving enough to go to Vanaheim or to Asgard, and they weren't the best of people, they end up in hell, and it's just a sad place. But the thing is, all the people in hell will be assigned to go fight the gods at the time of Ragnarok. And here we have uh, Niflheim, and in Niflheim there's several things happening. If Muspelheim was land of the fire giants. Niflheim is also land of more like frost giants because it's just a land of ice and fog. Very, very cold. So if Muspelheim is hot, Niflheim is cold. Also found in, in uh, Niflheim is Nidhogg, the dragon. And here's baby Nidhogg. He's just growing. He's young right now. But, you know, he's doing his thing. He's waiting for the end of days for Ragnarok. So he's just living in his stump. And what does he eat? Well, apparently, in Niflheim, there's a castle. Not a nice castle. This is the castle of all the people that aren't very nice, like murderers and things of that nature. And they go in the castle, they live there, and guess who eats them? That's right. <laughs> baby, baby Nidhogg gets to suck the blood of all the people living in the castle, and that's what uh, he's feeding on until Ragnarok. So there you go. Also, there's the third well, the Roaring Kettle. That's where all things that once were living go back to the Roaring Kettle. So there you go. That is our nine realms of the Norse mythology. Thank you. Well, that little journey in our long ship heading through the nine realms of Norse mythology. A little bit tired. Maybe need a snack. So I'm heading back to the tent. Play some henna topple, Relax. So let's go back to the tent. All right. Just getting myself some water here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's good. Thirsty work that long shipping through the nine realms of Norse and mythology. And when Vikings chose to sit and relax, they were very social people. They had food, they had music, games, they were reflective, they would deal with their rune stones and try to contemplate their future and what they're doing by what the rune stones would say to them. Uh, they had uh, traded for horses when they could and they had also have lots of uh, races and games involving horsemanship. So they did that. 
Henna Tafel. Henna Tafel is a very popular game back in the day of the Viking era. It could be found all through it's the trading places throughout Ukraine, Russia, and all sorts of places like that. And it's, a, uh, it's a, a battle game. Much like chess is today, chess is a strategy game where you have many pieces moving in many different directions. So you have to keep your eye on lots of parts of the board. Henna Tafel is similar in that you have, a def you have 12 defending players who are defending the king who sits in the center and you have 24 attackers. So we're already outnumbered. You got 12 to 24. And the idea is that this king has to make it to one of the four corners in order to escape and survive. The game is played by um, uh, pinch and capture in that these players can move so, like straight lines any direction, any direction. So they can go this way, they can go this way, but they can't move sideways. And they can move as many spaces as they want, but they can't jump a player. Okay? So, to pinch and capture, what you're basically doing is let's pretend, for whatever reason, that this player here decides to move there. Okay. Then this player will move here, and this guy's wanting to do something else. So he says, you know what? I'm creating a diversion, because now I'm going to start moving my players from over here this way. So now I'm creating a diversion because I can attack from all sides at the same time. But I, I decided to myself, you know what? I think I'm going to take your player. So I can take this guy here and move him down and see how there's two big rocks. Those are my, my defenders and all the small rocks are attackers. But now I've pinched that attacker between my two rocks. That means I can now take that person off and he's no longer in play. Okay? So that's how you kind of, that's how you would play the game throughout. So, so you're trying to pinch off people, trap them between your, your players and remove them from the board. But remember, you have only 12 players, they have 24, and they can move from all four sides and create all sorts of different situations on the board that you have to navigate through. So it's a lot of strategic thinking as how to create a path for yourself and your king to get to a corner, how to block, how to defend. So a lot of thinking happening at the same time. And it was a very, uh, it's a status symbol too, because if you were a really good Henetafel player, you had a lot of status. So they spent a lot of time learning this game. And again, just like in chess, learn strategy, you get to learn to think quickly. And this game would help practice the strategic thinking in the Vikings minds as well. So a day of traveling in your longship, a day of trading or raiding, you have the evening, you're going to have your some food, you're going to have some drink, you're going to play some runes, play some music, play some henna tafel, and then you get to sleep in this nice open tent with all the bugs.